Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Dustin and I'm super excited to let you know about a new workshop that's going to happen at Revere Glass. Simone Cristani, the Italian master glass blower, will be coming to Berkeley to do a live glass blowing demonstration, live workshop, questions and answers. You can interact with him directly. This is an amazing opportunity because he is one of the best sculptors. His work is really clean and beautiful and you can learn a lot about how to apply his sense of design and clear communication of his work right into your work i'd love to see you there all right you guys today i have something kind of cool to show you it's some stuff from the archives these were some of the first videos that i tried to make about educational glass but there was a couple beforehand but everybody's got to start somewhere so i wanted to share these with you guys and we're working on some new stuff. We're cooking up some new stuff in the kitchen for you. So sit tight and enjoy the stuff from the archive, which you may have never seen. All right, guys. Hi, I'm Dustin Revere. Glass wine is one of the funnest, most exciting things you'll do in your life. I've been doing it every day for 15 years and I still learn something new almost every single day. Hi. I'm Dustin Revere, welcome to Revere Glass. I'm gonna give you a little tour of the studio and show you some of the cool things that we have here at Revere Glass, give you some ideas of how you can build your own studio at home. And uh, let's get started by showing you what a typical bench looks like. At Revere Glass, um, our benches are made to mimic what it would be like uh, for an individual studio at home. Most of the lamp working industry is done at home in private studios with one or two stations. And each station here is made to be an ideal station at home. So it should give you some really good ideas about how to put it together. We use stainless steel as our bench top surface. You can use hardy backer or another kind of metal tile also works. Um, you shouldn't have just straight wood or plywood. You need to have some sort of fire retardant material on top of the bench. At Revere Glass, the stations are approximately five and a half feet long, and in each station, there's a certain set of tools and equipment that's there, and I'm gonna show you what's here. This is the torch that I'm currently using. It's got a lot of firepower. You don't need one this big, necessarily. On each station, also, there's usually some, some tool racks, maybe a, a, a desktop annealer or garage. Uh, it's, it's important to have a vent hood. It's important to have well-lit work area. Over here, we have the gases coming into this station. On the top is oxygen, on the bottom is propane. And you can see the copper lines running behind the stations and the regulators on each station, which gives each torch individualized regulation so it doesn't have the toilet flush syndrome or if one person wants a big flame, it detracts from the other. Let me show you some of the different torches here at Revere Glass, show you some of the options available for you and it'll give you a good idea of what's available and what you may need. This torch is a Herbert Arnold. It's made in Germany, and it's got a lot of firepower. It can run on natural gas or propane. Let me show you another torch. This is a Glass Torch Technologies Bobcat, and it's a really nice entry-level torch. I'd recommend this to most people starting off. You know, it could last from six months to a few years for you, depending on the progression and what you'd like to make. This torch is good for making small beads, pendants, pipes, and sculpture. This is another torch that has been the standard of the industry for many years. It's called a Carlisle CC burner, and I would recommend this torch too. It's a great torch. Uh, the last torch I'd like to show you right now is a, a little bit bigger of a glass torch technologies torch. It's called the Phantom, and it retails for approximately $1,300. And it's a great torch. It should last you for a few years. You can make medium-sized pipes, larger sculpture, bigger beads. You know, the size of the torch and the quality of the flame is going to dictate what size of work you can make, how the colors are handled in the flame, and give you different characteristics for setting different temperatures that maybe one torch may be better than another one. So I'd recommend, if you can, try a few different out. If you have an opportunity or a friend who has a shop, try a few out, see which one fits best for you. Ventilation is one of the key factors to have a safe glass blowing experience. And let me show you mine. Let me show you how I've made it and give you some ideas and suggestions on your own. Each station is 
covered by a custom-made galvanized vent hood. And this attracts all the heat up to the pipes that go through and then out the ceiling. There's a fan there on the top and it pulls air from these five stations right here. Each one of these vent hoods is connected to smaller tubing that goes up to the main outtake. And these five hoods are controlled with that one fan. It's important to figure out the cubic feet of the room that you're blowing glass in and the fans are rated for a certain cubic feet per minute that they move. And what your goal is, is to have the air in the room moved three to five times per minute. And you can figure that out by calculating the cubic feet of your room and the cubic feet that the fan can pull out per minute. The rating is called CFM, cubic feet per minute. All fans should have that. And I think that the minimum CFM for a single studio per station is approximately 800 CFM per station is a very healthy ventilation and people have, you know, can go down to four, 400 CFM and still be okay. Behind the stations, we have copper tubing. And if you're gonna use copper tubing, it's important that you do not have your plumber solder it. This tubing has to be brazed. It's a really important fact and it's unsafe to solder copper tubing and use it in a glass blowing environment. So make sure that your plumber is using pure silver brazing to connect the copper tubing. It's good to have thicker copper tubing, like K is how they measure copper tubing in letters, and K is one of the thicker ones. You should use K if you can afford it, if you can get K tubing, if you need to make multiple stations, that's a solution. Our copper tubing goes from behind the stations all the way around the studio and ends up at our oxygen and propane tanks over here. And I'd like to show that to you, come on. This is where we keep our oxygen and propane at Revere Glass. And this is where our copper tubing terminates. And everything is supplied from these tanks here. Uh, in your own studio at home, you can get oxygen in one of two ways. You can either get it in liquid form, cryogenic form, or you can get compressed tanks. Each of these has advantages. Uh, the cryogenic tanks have a lot more oxygen and they're safer, but they're heavy and you need a professional to deliver them. The cylinders, or the compressed tanks, um, they are very safe, they're lighter, but you're gonna have to move them more and it's gonna, you're gonna have to change the regulators more often and you know, that's what most people do in their private studios initially anyway until they're working with multiple people. So we have two tanks of liquid oxygen here. Um, each one of these is measured in liters and these are 230 liters. You can get 165 liters and the compressed tanks are measured in cubic feet and one compressed tank that you may use for your glass studio is 282 cubic feet. We use propane as our flammable gas in glass blowing, and we use oxygen as an accelerant. Propane by itself is flammable, oxygen by itself is non-flammable. So when we mix the two gases together with our torches, it creates a hot, clean flame that's perfect for glass blowing. There's one other thing I wanted to show you guys, and it's not going to be necessary for you on your first studio, but I'd like to show you to give you some ideas if you ever want to build a bigger studio and have some friends with you blowing glass. This copper tubing is called a vaporizer, and we use this in larger studios to produce more volume. You won't need it right away, but you may think about it later on. Also, this is connected right over here, and there's another regulator, which is going to give me the pressure of the line, and I also have a safety valve, both on the line itself and on the tank itself so that if it builds up too much pressure, it will naturally release. The first kiln I wanted to show you is my kiln. It's pretty unique. Um, most people won't have a gas-fired desktop kiln, but I'd like to show it to you just so you can kind of check out a little history and the heritage of what glass blowing was hundreds of years ago. This is a traditional Italian kiln built by Gianni Toso and it uses propane as a heating source as opposed to electric elements, which most glass blowing kilns use these days. Uh, it's a little bit of heritage right here, so I just wanted to, to use it myself and to show people where glass blowing came from. It's not a digitally controlled kiln, so this is a little bit more difficult to use because you have to monitor how much gas is going in and how hot the kiln is getting. So when you're looking at kilns, you should be aware if it's a digitally controlled kiln or an analog kiln where you have to control it manually. 
This is the common modern day lamp working kiln. It's what most people get to start. It ranges from three to $500. And it's great because you can put your pieces while you're working it in here to keep them warm if you're building sections on a larger piece. And when you finish your work, if you got something a little bit bigger that won't fit through there, you can just pick this up, put your work in there, and anneal it right on your desktop. This is all people really need to start off with. This again is an analog kiln, so it's controlled by this dial here by the user and it has to change it once in a while because it gets hotter and colder. And then the user could monitor the temperature right here. Kiln should be around 1050, 1050 degrees is the general rule in lamp working. If you want them bigger stuff, thicker, maybe 1100. If you're doing really thin stemware, maybe 1025. Let me show you one or two more kilns. Here's the next kiln I wanted to show you. It's a little bit bigger, it's better made. It's got a cantilever door and it's digitally controlled. And these things make this kiln a little more user friendly, a little more accurate, and it's better for your glass work to have the most exact annealing temperature possible. So if you see, it's got a switch here and you can control the temperature and the ramp up and the ramp down and everything like that with these kind of kilns. It's got electric elements in the back. It's got the kitty door for you to keep your working while it's warming up. I recommend a kiln like this. It's about $1,500, $1,700 approximately. Let me show you one more. It's a bigger kiln. This is the last kiln I wanted to show you. It's a, it's a bigger version of the red one I just showed you. It's got the same advantages, the cantilever door, the digital control. This kiln has larger kitty doors so you can fit larger components in. It's also got the electric elements around the side which creates a very even heat. This is the daily kiln at Revere Glass. I use it every day for my work, we fill it up. And you need a kiln like this with a lot of people in the shop. Hi, I'm Dustin Revere, and before we get started, I'd like to just tell you three really key factors to being safe with glass. The first key factor is protecting your eyes. You want to have the best glasses you can afford, and you want to have glasses that are specific to the kind of glass blowing that you're doing. Let me show you my glasses. You can get them from Aura or Philips Lens, and you want to make sure that you get Dididium glasses and sometimes they have a welder shade of three, four, five over the, the Dididium lens. The second key factor to having a safe, fun glass blowing experience is having proper ventilation. Over your station, you want a ventilation hood and you want a fan that's, that's replacing the air in the room every three to five minutes, and that's important to your health. The last safety feature that I'd like to just iterate to you guys is a safe fire retardant work environment. You want to make sure that your table is either ceramic or metal of some sort and try to look into the right types of metal because certain metals are better, certain ceramics are better. Have a safe environment to work in. Glass blowing is one of the funnest, most exciting things you'll do in your life. I've been doing it every day for 15 years and I still learn something new almost every single day. So enjoy yourself, have a great experience on this adventure. I'll see you soon, I'm sure. Dustin Revere. Hi, I just wanted to show you guys a couple exercises that are great to practice as you're learning the fundamental techniques of glass blowing. I'm going to show you three or four different techniques and you should practice them whenever you don't really know what to do or you're just trying to improve a certain skill. You can always make a little exercise to improve that skill. So I'm going to show you the basic exercises and here we go. The first one is the Maria. So you want to start on the left side of your rod and you can use a seven mil, nine mil, or even a five mil rod. The more narrow it is, the more difficult it will be to make the Maria's. It's good to blow glass with one hand facing up and one hand facing down, but if it starts to get too loose and too difficult to control, you can always switch one hand up. 
So as it gets hot, I just push really lightly with my right hand and keep turning with my left hand. And that's a Maria. I'll show you a couple more times to make sure that you can see how to do it. I wait for this Maria to cool before I make the next one as I want to keep the axis of my rod intact. So as it heats up, I just push really lightly and it forms a little Maria. And this technique is used all throughout glass blowing in different ways and it's a common thread in the whole technique base of glass blowing. So I let it cool, make sure the axis is in line, and I go in. As it gets hot, you can see it moves around. I just push a little bit with my right hand and keep turning, make a Maria. It's important to try to mimic these exactly and try to get the spacing down and the shape right. And you can make them more narrow and more wide, but I'd first try to start to get them to look just like this. The next exercise I'm going to show you is called pulling a stringer. It'll be useful all throughout your glass career. And you can actually do this right on the rods where you practice your Marias. Let me show you how to do it. First you want to put a bushy flame on. Grab another one of your rods and heat it up. When both rods are the same color, it means that they're the same temperature and it's a good time to connect them. And you can practice your connection points during this exercise too by trying to get as clean and even as a connection point as you can without doing any tooling to it. So you want to hold the rod at an angle and go back and forth in your bushy flame as to create an even heat base for your strainer. Once you've pulled your stringer, you heat it up on the handle end, grab your tweezers, hold the stringer, and then put it down on the marver for cooling. Let me show you again. So if there's some leftover scrap here, you can just take your tweezers and pull it right off. So I'm going to make these ends into little balls and then practice the connection point again. Now you hold the rod in the, the flame at an angle as to try to create an even heat on the glass. The three key factors on a correct stringer is having it thick enough, straight, and thickness even. So as I'm heating it up, getting ready to pull, take it out of the flame and just pull nice and easy. Grab your tweezers. Remove the stringer and put it on the marva for cooling. Let me show you one last time. So I seal them together. And then I go in the flame at an angle to create an even heat, a wide heat. So as it gets hot, it starts to move around. And when you think you have a nice, even heat, you take it out of the flame and pull it out. If 
It's important to make sure your stringers are thick, straight, and even wall, even thickness. Hey guys, the next exercise I want to show you is making a hook. And we're going to put these last three exercises I showed you, making the Maria, making the stringer, and now making the hook. And we're going to make a little project out of that. So here's the hook. You want to heat up about a half an inch of glass. Make sure it's an even heat, similar to the stringer, but just not quite as much glass. Grab the tip with the tweezers, pull, and when it gets to the right thickness, you want to touch back down. And pull this waist off. And that's the hook. And then when you're done with that, you just take it off and put it down there. And remember, these are simply exercises, so we're not going to be saving these hooks and attaching them to pieces later on. It's just to practice making them. So you get your glass hot, grab with the tweezers, pull out, and you can just push down in that direction too. Grab this, take it off, and there you have your hook, you just take it off the rock. Let me show you one more time. You heat up your rod, maybe half an inch or so. When it gets hot, you grab it with the tweezers. And you can push down like that and connect it. And there you have a hook.